I don't think we had a liberal or um, identification because we weren't politically involved uh, at all. But um, I guess if you want to say uh, if, if there was some difference, it may have started back in grade school mm -hmm. because I went to a, a grade school that there were no other uh, yeah, no other Asians, no blacks in our family. Uh, what, my maiden name is Tanaka. We were the only ones in, in that was Daniel Bagley in um, Green Lake area. Mm -hmm. And therefore you stood out, um, you know, uh, like a sore thumb. And in, in our case, it was an advantage. It was kind of being treated special. Mm -hmm. um, and so being part of that select group, usually there's a, a group that um, gets all the favors and things hmm. like that. So grade school was, was a wonderful experience. Uh, you know, I enjoyed grade school a lot more. High school, too. Um, what I was going to say about grade school, um, I uh, thought we ought to have a newsletter. And so we didn't have any, you know, thing like that. So I asked the teacher, and she gave a go-ahead. So I made up a, a mimeograph kind of thing where the uh, office person did type it up, but I, you know, did all the stories and everything. And I, that may be one time when, when it, you know, it was uh, doing something different from, from uh, you know, the, the usual thing. So that may have set off. Um, uh, the difference, I guess. And then in, in high school, um, we had a few more Asians. There were about 10, 10 or 12 at Lincoln High School. Mm -hmm. But there, um, uh, I was in with so-called um, the Girls Club group, the, the Honor Society group, and so forth. And so um, I don't think that we had uh, political type of, of um, orientation in those days. Uh, at least I wasn't aware of it. So uh, I don't know where being liberal started. Um, somehow it seems like I was thrust into leadership roles that I don't know how I got there, but <laughs> I was there. And, uh -huh. and like in high school, um, the the Girl Scout president would be the, the top position within well, uh -huh. the honorary a group, which was called Triple L. Um, that was where I suddenly found myself as a president of that, which I had never even thought that I would want to be or aspire to be, hmm. and there I was, and, and I think I made a goof of it, but no, uh, not uh, that I can't remember because I hear people saying, you know, our parents uh, expected you to do this and so forth. My parents didn't, and it was more like you bring home a report card, and they, they it was just accepted that you were supposed to make good grades. And uh, they never urged me, they never pushed me, and I don't know. Uh, it was sort of a sense, I think we were aware, well, I know we were aware that we were minorities then. Mm -hmm. And it was that feeling that you had to do better. You had to sort of prove yourself. You had to, um, you know, show that you could do as well as the other person or even better. So that, um, that may be uh, somewhat the start of it. Mm -hmm. um, because sometimes I, I wish my parents had you know, either approved or disapproved, but they weren't very, um, they were stoic, you know. Mm. They didn't, they didn't, you know how mm -hmm. Issei's are, they don't show affection, and uh, a lot of times there wasn't a strong discipline, it was um, verbal, more or less. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, um, in a sense, I kind of missed that. I mm -hmm. wanted more discipline, but. <laughs> I didn't have that, so mm. yeah. I think so. Being out there, there wasn't the need to talk to other 
East Days, and it was only um, the very home style Japanese. And we couldn't express our feelings because I didn't have the, the vocabulary or the mm -hmm. ability to talk about feelings. So it's all very, you know, uh, mundane kind of things, you know, the, or the home style Japanese. So I regret I didn't know my parents better, mm -hmm. you know. I had just graduated um, in June of 41, and I was trying to earn uh, some money <laughs> to go to the university mm -hmm. because we had gone, most of us, you know, was barely making a living. Um, my parents had a uh, dry cleaning shop um, right across the street from that waiting pool at Green Lake. And, um, uh, there wasn't enough extra money. My brothers, who are older, uh, would go to the cannery, Alaska cannery, mm -hmm. and uh, make enough to go through school. Since I didn't have that, I, I had to learn a skill to uh, earn some money and then to go to school and um, to be job. able to do some clerical work or whatever. Uh -huh. But that, when I was in high school, I wanted to take some uh, um, what do you call it, shorthand, and the counselor uh, sat me down and said, uh, you will never be a secretary. So she discouraged my taking that. I have no idea when you think about it, but she uh, was very discouraging that we, you know, as, as Nisei could ever get a job in the outside world mm -hmm. as a secretary. So, uh, so I didn't take it there, so then when I, got out of high school, I looked around to, to, you know, where I could find the skills to get a job, to get, to earn enough money to go to, to school. And that's where the Pearl Harbor happened, December mm -hmm. of uh, 41. Uh, that was a Sunday, and uh, I, um, I remember going to the drugstore, and I heard the uh, newspaper boys in those days you know, the, when something broke, the uh, the newsboys would go out calling extra, extra, and then you know people would come out and buy it. And so they were. Uh, uh, I would hear the newsboys, and so when I got back home, I said, "Something's happening. We should turn on the radio." And so we, we turned on the radio, and then you know President Roosevelt was was announcing, you know the day of infamy. And the thing that stands out uh, on that day was to realize in looking at my father, his, you know, his whole demeanor changed. He was mm -hmm. just crushed. And I guess I didn't realize what it meant to us to have the United States and Japan at war. It just didn't sink in that that was going to reflect on us. And so, but when I saw him and saw, and he said something to the effect that this is, this is disastrous, um, then, you know, it began to sink in. This is not, uh, not a very, going to be a very happy time for us. I think through um, the newspapers and the news, uh, the East Days were aware that war was approaching, and so they, they were fearful of that. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a shock. It's something they did fear all mm -hmm. along. Um, a day or two after uh, Pearl Harbor, uh, then we got the visit from two men, you know, dressed in shoots and the hat in those days. And uh, I was, uh, my older brother, my oldest brother was in the service, so my next older brother uh, took over in terms of interpreting and all that. And it turned out the FBI had received a report that um, my father might be a spy because we had a uh, shortwave radio. That radio happened to be an $8, I remember the figure, $8 because we saved for, for Christmas, the Christmas before. And it was just a, a little old radio that couldn't get <laughs> the station uh, very far. But apparently, and we found out later, it was a, um, 
neighbor who had oh. who had said that. And so the FBI man questioned, oh, it must have been an hour or so, and found that, you know, there was nothing, uh, he was nothing but a humble little dry cleaning <laughs> operator, and so uh, they left. Um, mm -hmm. And um, then following that, um, we were, we felt that sense, sort of that, we needed to be very unnoticeable. And I, in other words, all social stopped. I remember there's going to be a dance at the Spanish castle and everybody, um, you know, uh, it was called off, everything stopped. Um, but December, January, uh, the weeks after Pearl Harbor, there wasn't a lot of, of um, uh, difference. There was a subdued feeling, but um, it was only later, um, several weeks or even a month later, that the newspapers started to come out with these stories of potentially uh, sabotage, um, so that uh, then the columnists, uh, Walter Winchell and all that, and that began to build. And then the labor unions, Dave Beck was quite strong in this area. And um, so then that um, sentiment among the public uh, began to build it. Because I think the records will show right after Pearl Harbor, there wasn't a lot of uh, outcry. It was only uh, later on. And it was stirred up by these elements. Economic forces, I, I don't think enough um, emphasis has been played on the economic factor. People looked at the farmlands and looked at the, the holdings of Japanese and wanted them out. I mean, this was a good chance to get them out of the area. And so the cry then began to, to move uh, all of us. I think in the sense that all activity, social activity stopped. We didn't, and then the curfew came, of course. So that was a very um, confining, depressing thing that made us feel, you know, that, you know, um, that we were suspect, that uh, um, that we had to be very, very careful of what we did. Or, and uh, of course, having had and heard about the FBI picking up people. And in those days, you, that was quite a um, terrifying thing to have the FBI um, mm -hmm. visit. So um, there was that feeling, a very depressing kind of a feeling during that time. No, um, my brother had um, a, a very tight group of friends uh, mm -hmm. who um, got together and uh, uh, we had that sort of relationship. You, brothers and sisters didn't talk very much <laughs> together, <laughs> just like some families, and uh, there wasn't that closeness. So um, it's, it's a little vague as to what we did during that time. There was some um, um, feeling of um, when we did talk with friends, you know, about what what's going to happen. And so when the orders finally came through, and uh, there was a period of time when uh, some of the people, and I remember, um, no, no, I won't say I remember because I he heard it afterwards, uh, the feeling that, oh yeah, the Isis are going to have to, you know, go, but. We're citizens, and and it's not going to affect us. There was that feeling, but uh, of course, eventually it turned out that it didn't matter. So, um, yeah, that's interesting because we simply had no idea, no idea whatsoever where we're going, what the conditions would be, and uh, we knew we should um, take clothing for cold uh, winters. Um, and 
it was very difficult to decide just what you should take and knowing we could, it was just the one suitcase that you could carry. Um, I know my mother had a lot of problems deciding where to pack things that were to be left and um, we tried to sell uh, the business, uh, the cleaning business and of course that wasn't successful because everybody knew we'd have to leave anyway so why would they pay for it. Mm -hmm. uh, we sold um, apparently the um, equipment, you know, the pressing machine and whatever for a very small amount, um, I think it was somewhere in the range of $50, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, we had a car and that was a very something really small. I don't have the figures, but I know it wasn't a fair market value in any sense. Um, and let's see, your question was how, how uh, primarily clothing because um, we were told different things that we n had to bring bedding. Boy, when you, when you have bedding, that really takes up just about yeah. every space. Then, so anyway, we concentrated on clothing as what, um, what we would need. Um, the uh, a strange thing, strange sort of ironic thing was that we were told uh, to report, I think at the uh, station, Union Station uh, down uh, where the uh, ID is now, but uh, we were given no means of transportation to get there. We had sold the car and we were way out there about, you know, uh, it was city limits just about then. And so a friend, an ESA friend uh, who lived uh, down here on Yesler um, said that he would come and pick us up. And so, um, because he was going to go maybe a few days later. So anyway, he gave us a ride. And so that we got down to the, uh, the, the um, gathering place there. But that seemed a little strange that here you're told to go a certain place, but figure out how you get there. It's uh, some very um, ironic things happened. I'm trying, you know, a lot of it is fuzzy. I do remember the days before when we had to go down and register, um, sign certain things, and I know uh, that was right down on Main Street that uh, we went there. I, uh, for some reason, that sticks in my mind. But the actual going and gathering there, and then I, we were put on buses because mm -hmm. we were sent then to Puyallup. I remember, though, getting there and seeing the barbed wire around there. Mm -hmm. and, and then we looked and saw the guard towers and you know, someone manning that guard tower, and that was sort of a shock. And then to see the barracks that we were supposed to, you know, make our home, that was, um, yeah, those are fairly vivid. Um, another thing was our first meal in uh, Puyallup, and here we were supposed to go to the mess hall, Nobody knew what to do, and, and our first meal there, um, beets, cold canned beets with raw onions in them. I remember that dish. I'd never seen a dish, you know, beets with <laughs> raw onions in them. And um, of course, we, then we got used to the uh, Vienna sausages, and the food was pretty bad. Um, and then, of course, there, uh, the latrines, were very primitive. They had um, one barrack-like structure and then uh, just a, a slab <laughs> with very indelicate but just holes and then a gush of water every once in a while coming through to clear it. Uh -huh. And um, no privacy. Uh, I can't remember the 
the showers there. Um, they're more vivid at Minidoka, how there were no uh, partitions at first, and uh, how it was, you know, very, I mean, you're not used to, to this communal kind of living, and mm -hmm. so that was really hard to take. Um, in uh, Puyallup, um, we knew some, like our, our family friends, because in the old days, there'd be picnics, um, like mm -hmm. the cleaning uh, shops would all get together and have picnic. Um, I did go to a, a so-called tip school uh, in Green Lake. There was one there, and so I knew, you know, that group. We were sort of called the Green Lake Bunch, and um, so, uh, and then we, uh, even in, in Puyallup, we had jobs. Uh, we had certain responsibilities that we were assigned to. And uh, uh, so then you gradually got to know people. I guess I had gone to um, the Blaine Methodist Church a few times, me even being out in Green Lake, then, um, and made some acquaintances. And uh, then, as I say, this um, Japanese language school, you know, I knew those people. So it wasn't as if, you know, total strangers. There were people mm -hmm. we knew. Um, and the, then, of course, gradually in Minidoka, you got to know a whole wide um, spectrum of people. That's interesting. I was somehow 18-year-olds, I think, were more naive in those days. And um, we accepted, I think, as something, uh, as a uh, authority, uh, what is it, the phrase, power of authority, the, the obedience to authority? That was very strong, particularly in our culture. And you still listen to, and, and the government, I mean, you did whatever the government said. Mm -hmm. There wasn't that feeling of rebellion, except for a few, as, as you know, there were very few who did rebel, but um, I don't think it really hit me. Um, one event that does stand out is um, when I went to Minidoka, having had a smattering of high school journalism, I applied for um, the Year Gator, and so I, that was, you know, everyone had to work, so that was our, my $16 job was to apply there. and. And um, after a while, I, I did some feature articles, like I did a feminine column, it was called Feminadoka, and did light things, you know, like, uh, what do you do with your hairstyle when the dust is blowing and all that kind of, you know, silly, stupid stuff. <laughs> and uh, so then once I sat down to do a column, and it was going to be, uh, reminiscing, you know, because we had been there maybe a year, and I was reminiscing about our past, and I was going to write a light article. And, and I looked at the typewriter, and I thought, really, you know, what is so great about, you know, this life? And and so that's when I wrote the column saying um, that um, the the dust, the cold. The, and and the bitterness and and but the the worst thing of all was the the lack of freedom that we could not go out you know we couldn't go as we pleased and here we were and um, it ended somebody sent me that column later and I didn't realize I'd said it, it ended something like uh, we're like birds in a cage or something like that and. Um, uh, so that's sort of when it really hit me that, you know, here we are, prisoners. We're prisoners, um, and we hadn't done anything wrong. Um, yeah, it better. was, sort of. And then, and then um, um, the, um, the editorials, um, the editor, the two who first came on, one was Dick Takeuchi, who was, who was a professional. I think he had worked uh, for one of the mainstream uh, press and had worked at the UW uh, on their 
is it Daly? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, then Jackson Sonoda, who was um, uh, editor of uh, the Japanese language uh, Courier and North mm -hmm. American oh, Post. Right. I, I don't remember if it was called that then, but. Um, and they had written some editorials that were, um, you know, brought out the injustice and things like that. And, and that, that gradually got me to um, um, realizing, you know, uh, that <laughs> there was such a thing as a constitution, that, you know, we had certain rights. But actually, the, the ending, the the anger didn't come out till later. Well, I think when the redress movement started. So it was just a, a lot of it was the acceptance that so this is something we had to bear because we're Japanese and because you know we're at war with Japan. So it wasn't until later um, that the full realization of of the injustice hit me. The uh, the camp was uh, formed of Seattle people uh, and a few, what, I think a few, how, then um, Kent and the Valley people went to Pinedale and, now, and then mm -hmm. to Tule. Um, but the Portland people went to the Portland Assembly Center and then they came into Minidoka. So it was kind of for the first time meeting people from another area. Oh. And um, so then, of course, there were the usual uh, social activities. Minidoka was essentially a small town. I mean, it had its fire department, it had its coal crew, it had um, a recreation department, churches, schools, and et cetera. And uh, I think it may have been at one of the dances uh, that um, we met. And um, of course, it was meeting people from another area. He's from Oregon. It was a little more exciting because, you know, it was different. And mm -hmm. so it was just the um, beginning of a, a friendship there. And then, and eventually um, um, he ended, not ended, but um, then from camp I went to Minneapolis and then um, he came out for a short time but then went back to go to school at Oregon State mm -hmm. and then that's when I went to join him and then we were married in, in, uh, in Portland and then I um, stayed um, at Corvallis until he finished school. And then we came up to Seattle, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Friends. they didn't, I mean the, um, you know, the dances, y you mm -hmm. made dates to, to go to the dance, although it, most of it was group. Like he had yeah. his group and, uh, you know, wh whoever each of them asked it sort of remained as a group, so. I guess it was the feeling that, you know, these people from out of town, I mean, they're from Portland area, and so it was a little bit different, so. And I guess there were some uh, inst instances of people going, um, Minidoka had a canal, and, um, and after a while you could, it wasn't fenced off, so you could go to the canal. And like when winters, when that froze over, people would, could go ice skating. Don't ask me where they got the skate. They did go ice skating in the summer. There was a swimming area. And so we had heard that, you know, some of the young people would would wander out that way. I wasn't aware of that. And uh, I'm sure that people were able to get together. <laughs> what effect the camps had? Um, well, you mentioned health. Actually, that Idaho weather was very good. I had allergies and whatever, and um, health-wise, except that I did have some uh, hospital stays there. Um, uh, the effect of camp uh, in the long range afterwards was uh, the fact that it totally interrupted my going to uh, any 
um, college uh, for years. I mean, then it was uh, after that getting married and raising a family and trying to survive, um, having to work and so forth. So if it hadn't been for camp, I think I would have then gone on to the university and that would have changed um, my um, so-called career. I didn't have a career. It was just merely jobs to to earn earn you know a salary. So that's where I feel it affected me the most. Is that it, it determined um, my later the way of life and how I earned a living. We all went out. That was another frustration. I tried to um, go to um, a college or university and I had applied for help to the uh, National Student Relocation. And the letter I got back from them said that your transcripts and your record, um, y you should qualify for the top level of Smith or Vassar. But that was it. You know, in the first place, I didn't want to go to any school like that. I wanted to go to just a plain, ordinary university where I could get some help and because we had nothing, no funds or whatever. So it, mm -hmm. it depended on the scholarship and, and a place to live and so forth. But uh, that was it and, I, and there was no, you know, getting me in touch with anybody or anything like that. So I was a little disappointed in the help that I had. And I never did find uh, the help that some people got. They were given a specific school, you know, that they could go to, and like the Friends University and all. They, that was, um, I, I have a friend who, who went there. And so uh, some people were able to continue their education. But um, the only way I could leave was to have some kind of a place to stay. and. Um, the reason I went to Minneapolis is my my older brother, who was already in the service, was at Fort Snelling because of the oh. MI military intelligence. And then my neck brother next to me uh, had gone out to Chicago to work, and then from there was drafted, and he was at Snelling. So with the two of them there, I thought, you know, at least you need some kind of um, contact or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I went to Minneapolis and started out in uh, working in a home as a place to, to stay. And I think I was there about a little over a year. Mm -hmm. And I kept trying to go to school. And so I ended up with a um, job at the University of Minnesota in the mm -hmm. ASTP program that was the Army training. And, um, uh, and then I was able to take a class or two. I still didn't have enough money to go full time. Uh, so, uh, in that way, it was um, fairly easy to adjust because there were the um, contacts you make through that. Um, and then I called my parents out to Minneapolis because the camps were getting ready to close. So we were there about uh, three years until eventually, as I said, when I came back, and stayed in Corvallis until my husband graduated. And then we went to Seattle, mm -hmm. and from there in Seattle, uh, we called our our folks out back to Seattle. So we ended up, you know, sort of full circle in terms of getting back to our home. So in, we came to Seattle in the '50s, and then it was just um, making a living, mm -hmm. and we had to both work. Um, and then uh, in 53, our uh, son was born. And uh, since my parents were staying with us, then uh, I was able to work. And it was, you know, necessity to work. So it was not much time to do anything other than that. I mean, working, coming home, you throw off your coat and you start cooking. And there wasn't even time to play, play with the baby and all that. Uh, but then by, as I said, uh, when Kyle, my son, was about 10 or so, then, you know, it began to be a little easier to think of, of doing some other things. And since I had been a JCL member in Minneapolis, 
uh, where there was a chapter. Uh, they, then I decided I'll see, you know, join the Seattle chapter. And I came in and the first meeting I attended, <laughs> I became secretary. <laughs> That's where I, I jumped right in and, and then, you know, from then on I was on the board for every year, every year or so. Because of my familiarity with JACL earlier in, in Minneapolis, and there we were doing, you know, mostly social things, mm -hmm. uh, getting together, fellowships, and this and that. Not involved in civil rights very much, very little. And so I was familiar with the organization, and therefore I again um, knew that, uh, you know, if, if I was going to pick any group, because I didn't have a church affiliation. so. Mm -hmm. I, I just joined JACL, and uh, mm -hmm. then it was after being in JACL, and Seattle chapter, around that time, I uh, had um, Min Masuda and Don Kazama, uh, who had just come in a few years earlier, and I, I don't know if you know, they were very, very uh, strong on civil rights, um, and, and just very inspirational leaders. And they led the chapter into areas uh, that, um, you know, it, Seattle also was a fairly social group, you know, picnics, um, socials, and these kinds of things. And then during Don Kazama's period, there was that protest about the Elks. The Elks had uh, a no uh, minority uh, policy. And in that period, they actually went, I think that was Joe Okimoto, uh, they went and actually physically uh, picketed. And very strange to me, I didn't join in that, but you know, this kind of thing made me realize that you do have to get out there and protest some of these things. So, um, you know, you gradually get caught up in that. Although I knew that JACL was not a frivolous organization, it had a purpose. Um, and then, as I say, Min and, and Don uh, were leading um, into areas. Uh, I'm trying to think of that other event. Uh, oh, some of these things, and they may not be chronologically correct, but then the Iva Toguri case came mm -hmm. along where JACL took up the cause, and when, when we understood the unfairness with which she had been um, convicted and imprisoned, you know, it was just, uh, she had been caught over in Japan, mm -hmm. and because she knew English, she was, you know, uh, impl I think she was employed to do that, but uh, mm -hmm. somehow she was picked out to be the, the scapegoat. And just just the injustice of, of that really mm -hmm. uh, stirred everybody up. and. Mm -hmm. and Somewhere, somewhere along the line, um, I had gotten this feeling of, you know, when something is not right, it's not fair, it's got to, you know, you've got to do something about it. You look around and is anybody doing anything about it? And mm -hmm. you've got to get in there and do it. So, um, I, and I can't pinpoint exactly, but, you know, it sort of grows on you as to these things that, that need to be done. Typically, Nisei, where there's very little conversation, you know, within the family, partly because our parents were, my parents were with us, and because we couldn't converse uh, freely, because we didn't understand other than, you know, the simple Japanese. So nothing about politics or anything mm -hmm. like that. That's the handicap that we had, That we didn't sit down at the dinner table and able to discuss with your parents and all these things. So I think that made us get a very late start in, in being active. And even now, there's the repercussion of we don't have a lot of political leaders. We don't have, mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, I think the Chinese group have done marvelously well. They're way, way ahead of <laughs> Japanese groups. People didn't start talking about it. JACL was the one who brought it out. And I happen to be fortunate in being here in Seattle where, um, well, actually the first contact was attending the 1970 National Convention in Chicago. And I remember 
during the business session, this fellow stood up and said, you know, we have waited too long. We need to address the government for the injustice of the camps. We need to do this, and JCL should take the lead. The resolution, everyone listened and agreed, and, and the resolution was passed. But um, remembering, too, that that year there was the murder at the uh, Palmer Hotel of uh, uh, one girl, and that just upset that whole convention. And so the, the following convention in 72, the resolution was again passed. That was in Washington, D.C. But there was no plan to do anything about it. There was no um, uh, definite idea of redress. Just we need to address the government. And I, I think Edison Noodle did have the idea of, a, of a several million dollar, I, I remember the figure, 400 million, to establish community, um, a fund to help the community. Um, and then around that time, and I've been doing this for our project, I remember that um, I was filling in as a, as a vice president um, in our chapter, and we had a, a meeting. And uh, that one meeting, uh, I was told that on the agenda should be um, a request from our Washington, D.C. rep, who was Barry Matsumoto at the time, that um, uh, we need to respond to this. Uh, Barry had sent out a memo, and it was on a ditto sheet, out of that purple kind of seat, and I, I still remember that, pitching that, and explaining that here we've passed this resolution for two conventions. What are we going to do about it? Are the chapters going to do anything about it? And so I was, had that on the agenda. So I presented that, and I said, is anybody willing to do some research on, on this and you know what we can do? I didn't expect anybody. But then I saw this hand raised, and that turned out to be Henry Miyatake, which, you know, in a sense, um, uh, that sort of uh, is um, um, indicative of, of what happened. Because Henry had been studying, researching the losses. He had been going to the libraries and doing some of this preliminary work. So that's why he was all prepared. And so he came back uh, a few meetings later with this plan of a, a legislative plan to, you know, ask or demand of the government. Uh, and he had figured out these figures, 15,000, you know, for each individual and so much per diem for each day in camp. You know, to us, that was just outlandish. I mean. 15,000 for every individual in camp. I mean, we couldn't dream of anything like that. Too much. I mean, <laughs> those days, you could buy a house. Well, back in, in the 40s, you could buy a house for 15 easily. And, and to think that the government would actually compensate each individual yeah. seemed um, impossible. Henry yeah. is one of the first, if not the first, mm -hmm. to bring up individual payments because previously they had been talking about grants or community right. kind of things. And Henry was very strong and he and Shosuke are, I would say, the ones that convinced me of the rightness of, mm -hmm. of individual payments, of the rightness of asking for monetary compensation. Apology fine, you know, we need that, but you need uh, monetary compensation to back that up. Because, and the phrase that sticks in my mind is our American system of justice. You don't go to court and just say you've been wronged or damaged. There's always a monetary award. I mean, you, it's like Bill Martani says, if you have a traffic ticket, you don't go down and apologize that you did wrong. There's monetary, and that's mm -hmm. our system. And so gradually, you know, when they brought that out, mm -hmm. it, it, then I gradually began to accept it. Because initially, so many of us felt, you know, you don't ask for money. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it doesn't seem right. Somehow it seems like you're asking for a handout. And uh, it was putting a value on this, too. I think so. Um, I know that 
when they sent out surveys, then the, the responses came out down because people didn't have to get up there and speak about it. You know, you don't have to sign your name. Came back very much in favor of individual mm -hmm. compensation. And so people felt in their, their hearts, yeah, but they don't want to come out and say, you know, this is what we want. So there was, you know, mixed feelings too. Uh, mm -hmm. Some people felt, no, you know, we're not going to ask for money. Uh, and others, you know, felt, and according deep down, they were willing to say that on a survey that, that uh, uh, monetary and uh, was, um, was appropriate in this case. Uh, so as you may know, or, um, Henry took his plan and Henry developed this from, they say, Boeing engineers, actually out of, uh, I guess there were five out of six or, or so that were Boeing engineers, and, hmm. and Chosky was the economist who had worked for Standard and Poor's. They had sat, I guess, at Bush Garden and, and over, um, you know, these uh, get-togethers or whatever. They had, you know, discussed about what are we going to do about this, you know, what we should do, and this sort of developed. And um, as I say, you know, gradually it was a, a um, process of getting people to realize that it was appropriate. What they did was, um, and somewhere around that time, 76 or 78, uh, where I, ha I had the presidency in 77, so I was drawn in as president. Uh, they sent out, they did a tape, Appeal for Action, and they sent it out, and this may, probably comes up in Henry's interview, to all the chapters, 100 chapters across the nation, they really didn't get a lot of response because uh, essentially JSU, a lot of it, and when they called, they said, well, we don't do that kind of thing. We have a picnic and a dinner once a year. So it was a struggle to get that through. And Henry will go through all the struggle. He had to get it, the national JSU to, to you know, support it and get on board. But um, as we see in the final bill, much of which um, uh, Henry and his group had devised remained, the concept remained, individual. And it isn't that different, 20,000 as opposed to 15. Um, in the final bill, it didn't, didn't, um, uh, it didn't uh, just uh, zero in on, on camp attorneys, but it, you know, extended mm -hmm. to other people. But um, the basic thing is, is there, and so right. we do have to credit Henry and his group for um, devising that and sticking to it, you know, and weathering all the <laughs> storms. Um, well, I remember when Mike Lowry started to run for congressman, um, he was on his campaign tour. Uh, fundraising, and there was a restaurant, I don't remember if it was called King Cafe or Quantuck at that time, they changed names, but that little restaurant across from Four Seas, he had a fundraiser there, and there was an upstairs room, and I remember, um, this is the first time I, I met Mike Lowry, and I remember Henry approaching him, and I was a little leery because Henry's pretty confrontational, and saying to Mike, Will you support, you know, a, a bill for for Japanese American redress? And Mike was, you know, uh, a little taken aback at that time, but he he sort of indicated he would, and and he'd look into it. But you know, thanks to him, uh, after he won and was a freshman congressman, he went ahead and did a lot of research, and then he did um, draft this bill. Ruth Ann Grosse was with him then. And together was working with the Seattle group. And uh, this bill, the first redress bill, was introduced in Congress in um, 1979. Just a little prior to that, National JZL had met with um, the, the Nikkei congressman, and they wanted uh, to move ahead on the bill. And Senator Inouye. Uh, was the one who suggested, well, why don't we go for a commission? 
Well, uh, as John Tatishi says, you know, he was taken aback because he wanted a bill. And, uh, but then all of them, uh, you know it, Senator Inoue and uh, Congressman Mineta, Congressman Matsui, who was very, very new, agreed. And so that was the way it was set, and that bill then passed. Mike's bill then died in committee because mm -hmm. it was not brought out. So then the commission bill then became the thing to do. Now the Seattle group, and here, here I was in the middle of this group that was so anti-commission. They said, it's ridiculous. Everybody knows it was wrong. Why do we have to have a commission to determine if a wrong was done? And But see, the, the point of it was that unless you have an official body declaring it, that and then if they come out with a remedy, how much easier then it becomes to go through Congress a direct bill like my, uh, Mike's and what the Seattle group wanted would have gotten nowhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's face it, we realize now with all the political kinds of things that have to be done that that would have, you know, it would have died and there wouldn't have been much chance. But it was because of the commission and uh, the testimonies and the report that they came out with that then you had a congressional appointed body. I mean, people like Goldberg and Fleming and very distinguished people saying that this was wrong and, and this, you know, book, the report, and then the recommendation of the 20,000. Uh, so that gave it, that gave it uh, the stamp of approval kind of thing, and uh, it was very, very helpful. Without it, I don't think a bill would have gone through. Uh, what did I start to say now? I, I, my mind went on to um, commission. Um, actually, I get, became involved, as I said, as an officer of the chapter, and in 76, I was president-elect, and I think that's when uh, the Seattle group, and their formal name was Seattle Evacuation Redress Committee, um, began this appeal for action. And so I was brought into it in, in you know, a sort of peripheral way. Um, then um, in 77, as a chapter president, my involvement still was there. I was asked to sign different things. Um, and Although one point place where I did um, fall back a little was that I was planning to go to the San Jose, San Jose Conference, National Convention, uh, with the group, and the group was going to present the resolution to the national. And, and uh, that Saturday before we left to go there, my brother died in Chicago. So then I, I uh, I went to Chicago instead, and um, I wasn't able to make that convention. But I, I missed that, and missed that was the time that uh, the Seattle group actually sat down with Mike Masoka and convinced him to go, because he had been opposing redress in, in this form. And um, so I'm sorry that I missed that. but. I was still involved because of the role of, of the, the chapter in this. Um, so it was just kind of an easing into it, and my resistance at first of whether it was appropriate, and then there both Henry and Choske talking about the reasons and why it was essential, um, then I gradually got involved. Um, then uh, the Day of Remembrance, at Puyallup was November of 78. And I didn't uh, take a part in it except that I was asked to host some of the national JCL. So Cliff Ueda, John Tatishi, and um, oh, I can't remember the name of the PC editor at that time. So I was sort of uh, hosting that those people. And um, 
saw, you know, their reaction to this tremendous outpouring of over 2,000 people. That, that was so uh, moving. I and mean, to get into, it, we all met at uh, what used to be called Six Stadium there on Rainier, and then we got into these cars, and I can't remember if I was in a bus, but the sight of the stream of cars, all with their headlights out, moving down the freeway, just miles, and that was so inspiring to think all these people are out here and to go, you know, to the, the Puyallup. And then that, that I think was the first, very first uh, outpouring of, of uh, no, I, I, I take that back. It was the uh, bringing up of the feeling of, of the camp experience. Many people had either suppressed it or just put it aside, and they didn't want to talk about it. Uh, I know the, my reason, when people ask me why didn't I talk about it, is that no one asked me. I mean, <laughs> my son wasn't interested, and you don't force this kind of thing on a person. And so this is why I never talked to him about it, because he didn't show any interest. But the Day of Remembrance was a very sobering event where it first, you know, all these feelings that were hidden began to surface. And when you listened to the speakers and realized, you know, that what a massive injustice this had been, that was the start of it. Uh, so then I had that small role there of the link between National JCL and um, the local group here. And uh, that was 78. And then getting involved uh, with Mike Lowry, knowing Ruth Ann, so I had some kind of connection there. Uh, and then the next step, the major step that I see was being at a national meeting. I think it was a national board meeting in San Francisco. And that was the time the commission bill was on the verge of passing. And at that meeting, the word came that it was going to be signed. And two of the people, I think it was John Tatishi and Cliff Weta, you know, flew back uh, for that signing. And um, then leaving that meeting, realizing that the commission bill had passed, and coming back on the plane, I started to think, hey, we've got to be ready for that. I mean, it's in inevitable. Those commission hearings are going to happen. We have to make sure there's one in Seattle, and we have to be ready for it. So on the way back, I started thinking about that. And then when I got back, I called um, Henry and Chuck Cotto. And Gordon was here uh, on a um, what do you call them, a, a year-long um, sabbatical. sabbatical, I guess, at the U. And um, I think it might have been Mossy Tomeda and Ken Nakano, just few, a few of us. And again, we met at Quantuck or whatever. And, um, and I told them, you know, the hearings are coming, the commission is coming. Well, of course, Henry was very dead set against it. So I think it was around that point that he dropped out. He had some personal family problems too. But then at that meeting, uh, I said to Gordon, how about, you know, lending your name? Because we'll do the groundwork, and if you would co-chair this, you know, with me, uh, we'll make, uh, establish a community committee on redress, call all the uh, representatives of all the major organizations, and let's, you know, get ready for this hearing. And Gordon said yes. So, um, and as it turned out, he did, you know, not just a name only, but he went around and spoke, and, you know, his name lent a lot of credibility to it. But um, then the next meeting we had, we sent letters out to, you know, all the churches, seven churches, uh, the major organizations. So we had about 
14 um, representatives. They all didn't show up, but I mean there were 14 organizations represented. And everyone agreed to, to form a committee uh, of, um, to prepare for it. And so that was the start of what later became the Washington Coalition on Redress. And um, so then we got to work. Then it was determined that Seattle would be one of the cities. And we had a date. And then I was in contact with the commission staff. They wanted to know where could they hold it in Seattle. So I went all around with UPS and different places as to the best place. And we ended up you know, at the Broadway Performance Hall which turned out to be ideal because, you know, the, the, the formation, the ability to see everything in, on that stage. And, and we worked a lot with the commission staff on uh, the setup. Um, and uh, then our job was to get the, the witnesses. So to prepare for that, I said to uh, our group, uh, let's have a mock hearing, get some interest. So we set a date, it was in May, and uh, we uh, went through some workshops to get uh, people to, to into the habit of, uh, into the ease of testifying. And um, in that process, we found three very, very tragic stories. One, uh, one represented a loss of property. This fellow had uh, acreage in um, the Olympic Peninsula area and he totally lost it because of taxes and um, he was just it was just an outright loss and that was really um, quite tragic because that was all his life savings and whatever involved in that. Another one was um, uh, Teresa Takayoshi who uh, was in our committee and she was a um, um, mixture of Irish and Japanese. Her name was Takayoshi. Well, that was her married name. Um, but she had been married when the evacuation came. She had the choice of going or not going to camp, but they had children. And no way, she said, would she want to you know, be parted from her children. So she chose to go to camp. While she was in camp in Puyallup, her a little boy got sick and, and um, and they took him out to the hospital. And then she, she had to go and come back to camp each day, but she went to visit. And once she overheard a nurse saying to another one, let's let that little Jap kid die. And that was just really tragic that, um, and she realized she had chosen at age 14 to go with her Japanese background and so she associated you know with Nisei's all along but her story was really tragic and then the third uh, person that we chose to have this mock hearing was a fellow who was only about eight or nine I think it was eight he was mm -hmm. caught in Alaska with his father and um, the FBI came immediately and picked him up left him all alone I mean, there was no one else, so some neighbors and all sort of took him in, and they were, the Alaskan people were shipped down to Puyallup, and here he was, an orphan, in essence, and he had to bunk with the um, single, uh, some of them Issei men, and this little child, and he, he told a real touching story about, he didn't realize uh, what he could do with his socks, and they kept getting dirtier and dirtier, <laughs> and till somebody told him, you know, you could go to the the laundry room and, and wash them, but he didn't know. I mean, he's a little kid, yeah. and um, he told these stories about how he had to struggle, and it was so, you know, heart wrenching. Um, so we asked them, would they mind, you know, giving mm -hmm. their testimony? So we held a mock hearing at the vets hall. And we asked like Judge Smith, Charles Smith, and Ruth, um, I forgot her name, she's a city councilwoman, and about two or three others to be mock commissioners. We didn't know, you know what to expect, but we just assumed there would be commissioners and they would be asking questions and that they would be timed. And um, 
then we asked Min Yasui to come to present his uh, um, his favoring a block grant and Chuck Cotto to uh, speak for the individual payments. So um, we had this mock hearing and we had a very good turnout. The, the hall was filled, over 200 people. And um, that eventually brought out enough people uh, to witness, uh, to, to uh, want to uh, give testimony so that the, by the time in September um, that the hearing came, uh, we had 165 people that uh, mm -hmm. testified, and that represented people from Portland as well. So um, uh, the um, tremendous work was done by Karen Saraguchi of the district. Uh, she was the regional secretary, I think she, it was called then. Uh, um, she helped the witnesses uh, getting their uh, testimony typed, and she. She worked really, really hard. She was just, um, and so both of us were, uh, by the second day of the hearing, we <laughs> collapsed, and, but we, went, we got to the final day, but, um, but that was, um, and the one problem with what we did, I think we worked too hard in preparing people because we went down to Los Angeles, the first hearing, and the emotion, the raw emotion that came out, you know, was tremendous. And people wanted to talk and talk, and they had to be cut off because it was a five-minute time uh, period. But, you know, the crying and, you know, uh, the things of, you got to let me talk, or, you know, how many years you haven't let me talk, and this kind of thing well. going on. And so it was quite emotional and moving. And San Francisco was similarly so. Ours was <laughs> too well prepared, and some of the emotion uh, was lost because it all been, you know, kind of spent with the mock hearing and the preparation. So in a sense, I regretted that we over prepared. <laughs> but Bill Martani, who was one of the commissioners, says that when he got to ours, he says, yours is the best organized. Mm -hmm. Things went very smoothly. Yeah. We got the witnesses there, you know, everybody, there was no time mm -hmm. lag and this kind of stuff. But uh, I do regret that, uh, you know, it, it sort of killed a little of the emotion. Um, there were some very uh, uh, heart-rending one. Uh, I think there was a woman from Portland who, her story was quite tragic, but, uh, well, the things that I did say, you know, that, you know, the, the public events, and um, I think people hearing these, you know, others testify said to themselves, you know, I have a story, too, mm -hmm. to tell. I want to tell my story. And so um, when it got to that point, uh, then there was a, a, a big uh, um, a wave of, of feeling that, I want to tell my story too, and so it was amazing. You know, they many people ha held this up, um, and as I told uh, one of the small groups at the conference, um, it was in a sense my own uh, release too because I had been fairly stoic because I didn't have a really tragic experience, but. Um, and one morning of the hearings, um, I was having breakfast with Bill Martoni with, uh, I think it was Nobi, Nobi Chan, and uh, Bill was still, at that time, this was, you know, before the recommendations, he was still questioning the need for monetary and how much and why and so forth. And he may have just been testing, you know, he missed and maybe he felt down deep, you know, it was correct, but he expressed some doubts there, you know, when we were having breakfast. And um, then I started to tell him about the need. I said, you may feel that, you know, everyone is, is uh, comfortable now and, and not needing the money, but do you realize there are many Issei's who are on just Social Security and they are having, you know, problems. And, just thinking about it and talking to you about it, and all this buildup that we'd been going through came out, and I just broke down. It was terribly embarrassing. Here we were at the hotel. So anyway, um, 
<laughs> no, not my, my personal, but just the whole sphere of the injustice, you know, mm -hmm. and, and how it was so wrong. And, and having heard these, you know, very uh, touching stories, that it just kind of all built up and, and it just came out then. And uh, um, so I call that my, my catharsis there, I guess. Um, so um, I guess essentially people did want to talk about it, but it was a lot like in our, my circumstance. Nobody asked me, nobody wanted to listen. And finally here was someone who wanted to listen. And so, you know, the, the stories came in and, you know, some of these typed testimonies were lengthy because we were limited to the five minutes. So they had prepared a shorter version. And I think the whole uh, area of, um, I, it, was, it was educational for both our side and the commission. The commission went up to Alaska and had one hearing. They didn't realize all the 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 uh, circumstances of, of the tragedy of the Elliot situation, and they found that out when they were there. And I guess to some of them, they had no inkling of of all the uh, the upset, the total um, disruption of of lives that had happened. You know, I mean, you look at it from a third-party view, you think, oh, you know, they went to camp, they're out, and they're fine. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they don't realize the families that were totally disrupted. Uh, this one woman in, in California who, her husband, oh, well, the story is too long, and it's going to be told in, in other places, but some lives were just tragically, tragically ruined. So, oh, I think the very fact that they were able to talk about it. Mm -hmm. They were able to find out that other people, you know, really, there were people who suffered so much greater hardships than they, you know, most of them, like ourselves, we went through camp, and we lost education, this kind of thing. But some of the physical, and I guess there were some mental um, illnesses caused by that, and, and uh, you know, that very long range um, hardships that stem from that. I think it was an education to many of us that, um, hey, we didn't fare so badly. <laughs> Look at all these other people. As I mentioned, this sort of cathartic time that it, it let my emotions out, um, it, it was just one more step, a very, very significant step, but one more step into this total commitment uh, to redress, which turns out I spent half my life on it. So um, it was one thing, and then when that was finished, then then there was a hiatus in that we had to wait then, you know, for the, the findings of the commission. And in 82, as we're, we're checking our dates now, uh, California, uh, Priscilla Ochita and Assemblyman Johnson had accomplished a state redress bill, which compensating uh, 5000 for uh, state employees. So we saw that. We saw the reports coming in and saw on the PC that, that they had, um, you know, succeeded in that. So I was sitting uh, in the office with Karen Saraguchi, and I said, you know, if California can do it, why not Washington? Should we go ahead? And she said, why not? So then that's where I, I contacted uh, Ruth Wu because I knew she had good connections down in Olympia. And then I called Priscilla Ochita and said, how'd you do it, you know, give us some help. And um, she told us how they did it. And so we took off on that uh, drive to, to get the uh, state employees, and, and that started with Rod Sims and Tim Gojo and Ruth Wu down in Olympia. And then they asked me to come down there, so I met with them, and they said, well, they can do the legislative part of it, the inside work, but they'll need community support, the lobbying, and JCL, I, I guess, you know, that's me in terms of, yeah, I guess we'll commit. So. 
So then uh, we went back, I went back and um, got the chapter to support it. But, um, you know, like anything, there's a lot of enthusiasm at the beginning, but as it goes on, you know, it's harder and harder. That was quite a experience. Um, it, it, it came that, um, it, it developed that um, Ron or Ruth would call me and say, you know, there's going to be a hearing or there's going to be a committee meeting and then gradually found out all these steps that have to be done for a bill passage. You have this committee and then it gets out of committee. It's sort of a mini uh, version of what happens at the National. And so this was a great learning experience. So then uh, he'd want people to come down, so I'd gather people and we'd go down to Olympia and to show faces, Asian faces, and, and then uh, hearing and then testimonies, um, state employees. Okay, there was Mei Ishihara and Frank Kinomoto were the only ones in, in our area who were actually, you know, former state employees. So we got them to go down for the testimony part of it. And um, of course, for them, Frank did pretty well, but May was petrified. You know, she'd never gotten up spoken before. Here, the microphone and all these, you know, uh, legislators sitting around. And so I kind of had to, you know, lead her and steady her. And, and so she, she did okay. And so this helped. And then there's that, and then you go through the House, and you go through the Senate. Well, it was introduced in the Senate by George Fleming. That was interesting because uh, Ron Sims was George Fleming's aide, and, and he said, I think Senator Fleming will introduce it. But it was several months that um, we couldn't get commitment, and uh, uh, we asked Ron about that. But, you know, Senator Fleming, here he is, you know, he's a, he's a black legislator and the thing is he might get flack from his constituents why is he pushing something for Japanese Americans you know why isn't he doing something and he had that to contend with too so and uh, but anyway eventually in January of that uh, session he did introduce the bill and then you know it was up to us to get the community uh, lobbying uh, support in. So a lot of it was saying, you know, where do we go? What should we do? And they'd say, well, come and talk to Sen uh, Senator so-and-so or Senator this and that. Kent Pullen was a very conservative one, but the point with him was the constitutional. You, you tie it to the Constitution, then you get support, and we found that uh, along the way. So he came on board, and uh, then it was getting appointments, you know, and, and going down and talking to him. Maybe it's only five minutes, but you get the story across, and being an actual internee helps because you can say you were there, mm -hmm. and then, uh, then it was walking the halls, you know, just catching anybody whenever you can, you know, stopping and saying, you have a minute, could I talk to you? And then, or if you do stop by and they aren't there, leaving a note, stop by, you know, would like to talk with you again. That is the word for lobbying. That is almost the key word for assistance. I mean, this is what we found uh, lobbying for the, the national bill, is time after time going after them and, and never taking, you know, no, you know, whatever excuse. But uh, uh, um, let me finish with the uh, state bill. Um, so then, finally, and then Naomi Sanchez was in Governor Spellman's office, and that was very helpful. So eventually, you know, as as we got uh, one after another in terms, and Gary Locke uh, and Art Wong did the uh, House side, and um, we worked, you know, with those legislators there. Um, then I found that at one point, the bill then goes to the Rules Committee. And until, unless the Rules Committee lets it go out, they could just get bottled there. So then I found that John O'Brien was the key to that. So I tracked him down. I couldn't get him. And I finally, I think I went to his house. So then he agreed that he would let it out. And so 
it got out of rules, and then um, so it passed. And um, then we had uh, that ceremony where Governor Spellman signed it, and you know we we all went down. But you know we sort of kind of sighed and said, well, you know we've done this now. And then Tim Wotani was in the regional office. And he said, well, why don't we do the city? So he, uh, you know, checked with Dolores Sabanka, and, and there were three, actually there were five employees in the city, only three of whom were eligible. And he and Doris pretty much carried, Dolores carried it through. And I would just brought people to, to attend the hearing so that there would be Asian faces. And, um, and then that passed, and Mayor Royer signed that. And then <laughs> Mako says, hey, she found this story about the, uh, the school clerks, you know, way back then where they were just uh, um, fired. They had to resign because of uh, Jimmy Sakamoto and this and that. And that story came out. And Mako Nakagawa said, you know, let's, let's get the, the school board. <laughs> and I see I was kind of worn out. And so I said, well, if you can get somebody, so she knew T.J. Vassar on the school board, and so she got him to introduce the resolution. I found the the, the school uh, sec clerks, I guess they were, uh, several who urged them, you know, we've got to show people that you were there and what happened to you. So they, again, see most people, most of us were never used to standing up and testifying in, in this kind of, atmosphere and so I think at least uh, three or four agreed to and so they testified and then um, there was one more meeting and the school board passed the resolution and that and I found out later Michael said that if she in fact just just recently when we're doing our own project Michael said uh, after she heard the stories from the school clerk and how emotionally it was so difficult for them then she she backed off and she said she didn't want it was interesting that uh, these things kind of develop mm -hmm. and have a life of their own and so um, but then we found out from Mike Hoagie who is the school board uh, attorney who was so cooperative mm -hmm. from the first phone call he was right back of us mm -hmm. and uh, he tried to get it through the, the 5,000 for each of them and found that according to the law, the school board could not uh, pay that kind of money without special legislation. So that meant another bill. Gary Locke said he would do it, you know, but it took two years and for different things to happen. So it was two years later that um, he introduced that bill. You know, that school clerk one, we got press, good media coverage, you know, and uh, all of these events, uh, the hearing, um, the state bill, or the school clerk's bill, each time we got press, media coverage. So in that way, I think Seattle was fortunate in that they realized and, and they were more aware you know, of, of the whole redress movement. Mm -hmm. And I think, too, they were aware of the role that JCL played because Southern Cal, you know, they don't think that JCL did anything, whereas here I mean, they realized the, the uh, great, um, you know, the, the, that JCL was a spearhead for a lot of this. So, um, so then um, after the, uh, we had to turn to, uh, at, you know, we got a lie for the, the national bill too, and so we went um, doing uh, on that, it was a matter of, um, I called Ruth Ann and said, how do you go about this? We've done some local, but, um, so she uh, gave me some tips about when you can catch them uh, when they're back in their district. And that's when I said, well, might as well start at the top. And I got Tom Foley's phone number in Washington. So I just picked up the phone <laughs> and called Tom Foley's office. And I got an aide who was called, I remember his name, Thad Lightfoot. And uh, he listened to me, and then he says, I think you better talk to Heather Foley, which is um, his wife, uh, Thomas Foley's wife, 
who was his administrative assistant. And she listened to me. See, Mike Lowry's bill was in Congress then, and because we started the national lobbying as soon as Mike's bill. Uh, and Mike submitted his second bill. His first bill died, and mm -hmm. then when the recommendations came out in 83, Mike submitted the second bill immediately. And so this is where we started mm -hmm. uh, lobbying. And so we were a little ahead of the national. It took quite a while to get going on that. But uh, so uh, getting back to, to Tom Foley, uh, she must have been familiar with, uh, Tom Foley must have been familiar with uh, Mike Lowry's bill because she didn't ask that many questions, but she said, okay, she would talk to uh, Tom Foley. He was in the hospital at that time with some minor surgery, so I couldn't talk to him directly. And she talked to him and came back, called me, and she asked a question. I cannot remember what that question was, but it was something to clarify the bill. And I answered it, and she went and I told him and then called a second time back and said, yes, you know, he will support uh, the bill. I did so many different things. It's uh -huh. hard to, to pinpoint one, because, uh -huh. you know, I try one way, uh, and usually, you know, you start out, you know there's a bill in Congress, or uh -huh. uh, like on the state level, you know that a vote is coming up on the committee for this bill, and I'll, if you have any questions about the bill, you know, I put it that way, so then it's up to them to ask me, I don't want to force it on them. And so that was one of the tactics I used. Um, but as I say, I think uh, Heather Foley knew the bill, and, and my uh, Tom Foley knew the bill. Um, but um, anyway, that was the first success. Following that was um, uh, Brock Adams was always supported. Mm -hmm. Brock Adams had supported Henry way back when Henry first had you know his plan. So uh, he was, and I caught him at a um, fundraising thing at Noby Chan's house. Brock Adams said, you know, immediately he would support it. And then later I'd go back and ask for a letter or something to commit. John Miller was the same. I caught him at a, um, at a fundraiser. And so these people who were supportive, uh, you know, could initially get, and we got those on early. Uh, then those who signed on to Mike Lowry's bill, then Mike gave way to Jim Wright and Minetta's bill, and so all the 40-some that he, uh, Ruth Ann had gotten, plus you know the few, they all signed over to the uh, wright Minetta bill. Getting back to the state, this was interesting because I went down once with Jerry Shigaki, and, I, and we, we made an appointment with this one who was very, very negative. And so I was telling him about, um, you know, the camp experience, what it did, and, you know, fairly personal kind of things. And I was getting a little emotional about it. And I turned and looked at Jerry was looking at me like this, as if, you know, what is she saying? So after we got to, and this, this legislature didn't commit, but he said he'd think about it. And we went up to the hall, and Jerry says, you were really, <laughs> you were really, torn up about that, weren't you, or something like that, you know. And, but that's the one <laughs> advantage, being a woman and uh, having experienced it, is you can let the emotion come out and, you know, a, a male, um, a man could not do that very easily. And I can't see any of these Nisei fellows going out and doing that, you know. So in a sense, it works for me, even though I really felt it. it it helped, you know, because it showed the depth of the, the feeling that we had. Plus, mm -hmm. I, when we were talking to Ron Sims um, recently in an interview, he said his, his uh, colleagues would say, yeah, you know, this is that woman from Seattle, Cherry, what's her name? That Bill, you know, <laughs> it got to be identified. That's one thing I found. Get to the point of being an individual to them. Like with Al Swift and Everett, we went up all oh, time after time with different people. We used, and you know, you can't get an appointment just by saying, we'd like to talk about the regress bill. You have to have, after the first time, and they put you off, then you have to have some reason for going again. Hmm. Well, we 
almost devised reasons. Uh, there was somebody who wrote to us and said they knew Al Swift, they know a teacher, uh, they both know this teacher who was going to be honored or died or something, but they had some link. And I said, well, Mamie, why don't you come with us the next time uh, we go to see Al Swift? So then on the basis of that, I got the appointment saying there's an old school mate of uh, Representative Swiss who'd, who'd like to see him. And so, you know, they made the appointment for it. But you had to, you know, they put you off. Oh, you've been here before. We've talked about it. So you have to figure out reasons or uh, use a um, deadline. There's going to be a committee vote, such and such a committee. And we need to see if you have any questions about that, because that vote's coming up. And you're going to, you know, have to vote on that. So, you know, different things like that. Or um, you, you almost have to be creative. <laughs> but as I'm saying about being individual, um, it got so persistence, the other thing. So he knew me by name, Al Swift. I mean, I wasn't just one of a crowd. And one time, his reasoning was so strange of why he opposed it. He would say, yeah, yeah, I, I have support it, but this 20,000, it trivializes it. And we said, well, how? He says, well, it's not, it's not, it, it makes the injustice, the, the people who did this, it lets them off too easy. We couldn't figure that out. Why would you oppose if 20,000 is acceptable to us, it's a token, you know, and we, we'd like to see the bill pass because then it's a token that, you know, Congress agrees. I think it was, he had an aide, uh, a sunset from Hawaii, and he was mouthing what Senator Inouye had said initially, that it trivialized the event. But Representative Smith, sort of put a, his own little personal quirk to that in saying it wasn't, on the other hand, one hand he'd say it wasn't enough, but yet he wasn't willing to go. So I got a little irritated with him once. And, you know, I said just that sort of thing. I said, we're the ones that find it acceptable, and why do you keep, you know, saying it's not on the basis of how it affects the people who did this? Anyway. Afterwards, I thought, oh, God, why? <laughs> you don't speak that way to a representative when you're trying to get his support. <laughs> so I worried about that, worried about that. And so Easter was coming up. So I thought, well, I'll just do this. I went out and got a real nice plant. And I went up to, to um, Everett. And he wasn't there, but I left it with a nice, no, his office, because I, I wouldn't know where he lives to his office, and then his aide, I'd gotten to know her quite well. So anyway, she told him, I guess, you know, I'd brought it all the way up. But anyway, it got to the point where he was calling me Cherry, you know, and this and that. And, and, um, to, to, and it, that works with all of them. If they begin to know you as a person, they know if they vote no, they're going to have to tell you they voted no. And so this is why it's persistence so that they know you, they know Becky. Becky, you're the one that came down and, you know, asked for my support on this. You know, I have to think twice before I have to tell you mm -hmm. that, no, I, I didn't vote for it. You know, this is, this is the thing, you see. So anyway, that's one thing I found out about, oh, and to, to indicate the personal Lization of lobbying is, if you might call it that, and I didn't get a chance to say this at the conference because my time ran out. But on the day of the vote, September 17th, um, when um, um, Mineta had asked for that vote to be taken on that, uh, commemorating the anniversary of the Constitution, um, that day, you know, we were all kind of waiting, and the phone rings. And then uh, Don Bonker, who had been resisting all this time, said um, he was all, I don't know, distracted. And he said, he was talking about, he missed the vote. I said, you mean the vote for the bill? He said, no, I missed the committee. I was in a committee meeting, and I missed the vote 
before the Lundgren amendment, Dan Lundgren had submitted an amendment cutting out monetary. Mm -hmm. And Don Barker was saying, I missed the vote. I didn't get a chance to vote no. And then he said, but I'm going to vote for the bill. And so, you know, I was surprised that he would call me. And uh, then later that day, the phone rings. And, and I pick it up and say, this is Al. Al? Al Swift. <laughs> he says, I wanted to let you know that I voted for the bill. I said, oh, thank you. They get to know you. They get to know, you know, you're a constituent. You, you know, you want to know if they voted for the bill. And so this, I think it, it ties up to the fact that you've got to be more than just one individual, you know, of that group, you know, that group that wants it. You have to make yourself known as a person. The whole experience of lobbying was just a tremendous experience. And I saw somewhere, I think uh, Mineta has said um, that when you get a vote, you know, how exhilarating it is. I didn't realize for that level, too, it's the same thing. And uh, it, it, when you get a yes vote, you know, that, that's another one interesting was Rod Chandler. He held out until the very day of the vote. And then that day his aide uh, called and said uh, he was so impressed with the meeting that Tomio and Tim Gojo and I had gone to meet with him. And at that meeting he had kept saying no, no, he had some objections. And when we were leaving I said, well, uh, Representative Chandler, could we tell our group that at least you'll, and then he interrupted me, he said, no, he says, tell your group you went away disappointed. So mm. he just cut us off. And so I thought, oh, God. And so as we were leaving and we were shaking hands, and then I, then I, when I shook his hands, I made one last try. I said, Congressman Chandler, when the, when it comes to the vote, uh, just remember that if nothing else, it's the right thing to do. Please remember that. And we left, you know. So then on that day, after his aide called and said that he's going to vote for it, I had C-SPAN on, you know, and they were doing the mm -hmm. proceedings. And here I didn't see Swift, I didn't see any of the others, Norm Dix, any of them was talking. Here's Congressman Chandler standing up there, stand, you know, on the podium saying, we must do this, et cetera, et cetera, that this is only just. And he says, I've thought about this for a long time. And in my mind, uh, I had difficulty. But in my heart, it told me that I must do it because it's the right thing to do. Quite revealing that politicians are politicians, you know. It, you know, it could have been there was word from the Republicans, yeah, let's, let's vote right. for this bill. There could have been somebody, his colleagues or Lowry or whatever, saying, you know, come on, you've got to vote for it. All these things could enter into it. Senator Inouye himself, now this gets into appropriations, but as an example, is he, he called in his chits. Mm -hmm. They refer to that as, you know, you owe me because I helped you on this bill. Mm -hmm. There's a, that going on. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you don't know exactly what made a person vote for it. Sometimes it's just the leadership says, you know, this is an issue we need to support. Um, some, like those congressmen who are in states where there are no constituent right. Nikkei, then it took maybe just one Nikkei finding that one. This is where Grace Uehara, the national days here, was important to locate somebody in Georgia who knew and could talk to Pat Swindle, who was very important to the passage. And she met with him, and you know we we have um, we've been able to videotape that meeting you know, recalling Pat Swindle, um, and that he supported it. And as Grant says, he was a, a born-again Christian, but he had certain ties, you know, with the, I don't quite how it fit in, but the abortion, anti-abortion group or whatever. 
but all these very many facets of things enter into it and just the pure altruistic you know principle that it was justice uh, I'm with you I'm cynical I don't think you know I think that did play a p part but um, maybe not as you know not as hundred percent as one would think the the opposition was helpful because Lillian <laughs> Baker was such a, a weird person I mean her uh, reasoning uh, when you look, I mean, it angered you, some of the things she said and, and claimed, but it helped to um, to uh, strengthen, you know, the the support because she was so outlandish. She did have some supporters, though. She had some people here in the, the Kent Valley who came mm -hmm. out to the hearings, um, and there were uh, at least uh, two very strong Baker uh, um, colleagues who, who testified. Uh, there was opposition from the veterans. Locally, Nisei veterans were opposed at the beginning, and they gradually came on board. Um, but the, 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 the majority of veterans organizations, VFW, American Legion, uh, at first, uh, at first, in the first instance, you know, they would oppose it because they still link in their minds Japanese Americans somehow tied with Japan, the enemy, and uh, you had to get around that. Um, so we had some people, Art Moyamitsu, uh, for mm -hmm. one, was tremendous in getting to the um, veterans organizations in, you know, pleading the case and, and making them realize that this was an American issue that this was, you know, constitutional issue, and it wasn't a matter of the enemy, Japan, and we, in a sense, looking like the enemy and this kind of thing. So uh, that was important to get that support, or at least um, a neutral position, and that was what was accomplished, mm -hmm. so that you didn't have this outpouring, don't support the bill from, the, you know, the veterans group, because mm -hmm. That would have been very um, difficult to overcome. Um, I don't know if phrasing it as getting, because redress was a process, um, but did it accomplish what we wanted? And actually, I was thinking about that because uh, I questioned when we talked with Mike Lowry, um, I wonder if there could have been some other way to um, accomplish redress, not necessarily monetary, you know, individual. Uh, we did have in the past the Social Security and the Federal Service, the addition of the time uh, to our you know, the earnings credit and so forth. They didn't, you know, make a lot of difference, but at least it was a, a sign of the government acknowledging it. Um, and then we had the American Promise, which was acknowledging um, the rescission of EO 9066 and acknowledging that um, the loyalty of um, Japanese Americans. But as somebody pointed out, that was not an apology and you reread re that, and yes, it, it, it doesn't constitute an apology. It's an admission that it was a wrong. Um, but, oh, as I was saying, as I was talking, asking Congressman, or Mike Lowry now, I guess, um, how he viewed it, I said, could there have been, say, I mean, just taking an example, there could be, I guess, all kinds of things, but lifetime medical for uh, uh, internees uh, on the presumption that, you know, camp had damaged them physically. And I think there are many people who can validly claim that, you know, the, the treatment they received in, in uh, the hospital as such. Um, whether that would, the reason I asked him that was, um, 
because we saw some ugliness in, in the monetary. People, for instance, I see one of the questions of people who didn't support it uh, in the beginning, and yet when it came to pass, um, first in line kind of thing, and as if it were their due in terms of, I earned it because I was in camp, not realizing that when they were asked to help in this years and years of struggle, you know, they couldn't, they couldn't lift a finger. Uh, that, that was excusable, but uh, some of the other ugliness I talk about is we've heard that um, there were families that de deliberately left out other family members in reporting, uh, you know, when you report who all in your family because there were some family problems or there were some family dissension. Mm -hmm. uh, there were some feelings of, um, where's my chick, you know, this kind of stuff. And it was kind of disheartening to see that, uh, that that was, you know, the money part of it. But Mike's answer was that, you know, it's the same thing when you go to court, you know, it's damages and we're talking about monetary. Mm -hmm. That's that's what our system, how it's based. And he didn't see any other uh, way to do it. And the fact that it was individual was helpful because it wasn't just a block grant and many people would not have had any um, benefit or whatever from it. But as to whether it accomplished what uh, we were looking for. I think it did in the sense, as a, as we said uh, in talking about this, how it brought out the feelings, it, how it finally people were able to, I think, put closure to the whole thing. I mean, it keeps going on. These things, it keeps coming up. But I think it puts closure to the emotional part of any bitterness that at least, you know, the government apologized. At least there was admission by vast numbers of people that it was wrong, that, you know, there wasn't uh, disloyalty. I mean, being incarcerated, um, the implication that there was something that we, we had to be incarcerated for, you wiped that out. And so I think, I think that, yes, it, it did. Um, there might be, there might have been some other things that could have been better, maybe, but uh, I think essentially our goals uh, would be met. This, this is ongoing, too, and we're still talking about it. So, you know, there's no point at which we say until we're gone, I guess. And maybe it'll take historians many more years to, that's, that's a question I have. Will this be forgotten, or will right. this remain in history? Uh, will it be said that, you know, in 1942, it, there were 120,000 people uh, sent to concentration camps, but along with it, will it be said that, you know, through the efforts of this small minority, uh, the government did apologize, and uh, I think that's an important part of history. As new, genera new generations come along, uh, they aren't aware of it, and probably more people who were um, adults, you know, during that period, would be more um, can relate to it more. But um, you wonder how long or how far-reaching it will last. Um, some people claim, you know, it will go down in history, and others, I guess you can get cynical about it. Um, I think in our time, though, it is something that I think was um, unbelievable in, in thinking that it could be accomplished. 1.65 billion in Congress, you know, that, that's yeah. amazing. Well, I don't know, if I hadn't, become involved in regress, would I have, and see, I don't know for myself, would I 
become involved. Well, I, I can say that during the Vietnam protest, I did, in a minimal way, get involved. I suppose I would be like the nuclear test ban, you know, that I'm very much concerned about, had been all along. Um, so I guess I would have been involved in other things. So it didn't change uh, my focus, uh, probably. Uh, I mean, who knows? <laughs> uh, but I think the, the, the why redress was so close is because, that, you know, when it involves you personally, I mean, it's not like uh, environmental issues. Yes, they do involve you, but not so closely. So, you know, so, so very, very personally. So um, uh, I don't know how, how it would have been if I didn't get involved in redress. I've wondered about that, too, um, in terms of how do you, I guess it's somewhat like, how do you develop a conscience? Can you say, you know, how did you get so you feel guilty about this or that? You know, where does it come from? Does it come from environment? Does it come from parents? What? I don't know. I don't, I can't find the answer, and I don't think social scientists can really mm -hmm. find an answer to that either. Um, because I can't relate it to any particular injustice that I, you know, experienced. I didn't, I, I can cite a few periods, points of discrimination, but nothing real traumatic. I mean, I always knew you look at the mirror, you know you're different, and uh, and I didn't experience anything that was terribly um, traumatic. So it's a good question. I don't know. I guess it's um, one thing would be to get involved. I mean, things don't happen just because they're right or wrong. You've got to work at it, and uh, whatever you can do as one individual. Uh, even though you may think it doesn't matter, you know, what does one vote or one this or that do, um, how hard you work at it can have ripples in terms of how it can affect uh, others. And I think that's true with all of us. Every one of our lives affects a certain uh, area or, you know, um, people you are in contact with. And if you hadn't been around, maybe this had not happened or whatever. So I think one should feel that whatever they do, not regard it as insignificant because, you know, that person may affect another person. Even one other person can make a difference. So um, I guess one should say that value what you do um, and I guess believe in what you're doing. I mean, don't, I guess people could have a goal of being rich, you know, having a nice life tough. And, and for them, that's a goal. Uh, as long as they can accomplish it without hurting a lot of other people, then that's fine. Um, what else could I say for future generations? <laughs> Live your life as, you uh, feel that suits you, I guess. Mm -hmm. I mean, each person has different goals. I think part of it is knowing yourself if you feel good about something. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, you've got to ask, why? You know, why am I not happy doing this, what I'm doing? Or what is it that I need to do to make me feel good inside that I'm doing it? Or if you're I don't know, sometimes you wonder about all the political bad stuff that comes out. How do those people feel when they're doing that? You know, how, how can they live with themselves if they are doing things like that? So anyway, I would say be true to yourselves. <laughs> be able to look yourself in the mirror and say, you know, you feel good about it, so. Yeah, I think uh, as far as uh, JACL goes, and I'm so wrapped up in that organization, uh, although I'm getting away from it now, I think there's this period sort of a floundering around what is the next big issue. 
what is it something that we can all be re united on and really mm -hmm. you know have no qualms about fighting for and so forth I don't know um, I think I'd like to see a lot more effort put into uh, the multicultural generation that's mm -hmm. coming up um, because for one my granddaughter is um, half Japanese and half of Norwegian descent and I don't know at this point whether uh, the multi the, the mixed races are going to have problems or not and if so shouldn't we be doing something about it shouldn't we and not necessarily problems but maybe um, things to benefit um, is it going to be uh, essentially no to the point where it's not going to matter at all in terms of race um, are we reaching that point where we're so getting so um, mixed and you know without marriages and all that we don't need to then the question comes up are we losing you know our culture mm -hmm. are we getting so for my for instance, my granddaughter, is she ever going to be interested in Japanese culture? Is she going to be interested in? Um, so you're looking at two things. One of, of reaching a point where it won't matter, but on the other, do you really want it that way so that you, you don't retain some of the, the culture and some of the things that we like to feel are definitely Japanese American. and um, because. As far as Japanese Americans go, as we know it, I don't think we're going to ever have that population again because we don't have the immigration and it's entirely different. Other um, Asian groups, I think, have the continuing stream, so it's not defined like ours where we have Issei, Nisei, Sansei, and we're down to Yonsei and Gosei, and maybe that's going to be, you know, the end of it. So, um, as far as issues go, um, you, let's face it, we still have racism. As long as we look like we do, we still have that. And it's maybe a matter of arriving at each problem as it comes. I mean, we've got this Asian violence now. What are we going to do about that? And actually, is it our responsibility? Because they're Asian, does that mean we need to carry the burden or the load of saying, hey, this is reflecting on all Asians, or do we, do we have that right or authority to say that any more than we do to say an African American or a Native American or, or Caucasian, you know, if, that if they are into crime and whatever. We as just general public, yes, but should we take any more responsibility because it's an Asian? Uh, I don't know. These are questions that will leave for your generation to figure out.